So there may be lots of different global lock zones. The number of suitable planets may be, may be rather low. Um, but nevertheless, the, the total number of planets is so great that uh, we still have to contend with the very large number of available places where life could have evolved. And that leads me to the final thought that I want to have on this topic of are we alone? If you want to say, if you have a gut feeling that we are alone, if you think it's very unlikely that there is life anywhere else in the universe, then one thing that may not have occurred to you follows logically from the enormous number of planets that there are available. The origin of life, which may only have happened once, only needed to happen once on this planet, uh, is a difficult topic which chemists are working on trying to discover, trying to work out models for how life originated on this planet. And so far they haven't succeeded. If you are committed to the view that we are alone in the universe, then the origin of life on this planet, on any planet, must have been a quite stupefyingly rare and improbable event. So rare and improbable that we could go to these chemists in their labs trying to work out what might have happened in the origin of life and say, you are totally wasting your time. Because what we're looking for in our theory of the origin of life is not a plausible theory of the sort that you might hope to unravel in your lab. What we're looking for is a staggeringly implausible theory. We don't want a plausible theory, because if it were plausible that life arises on a planet, then the universe would be crawling with life. And perhaps it is. All I'm saying is that if you're one of those people who believes that we are alone in the universe, then you have to stomach this rather surprising consequence that anybody who is doing research on the origin of life is wasting their time, because what we need is a very implausible theory. There can't be many examples where what we really need and seek is an implausible theory. Well, I don't think we are looking for an implausible theory, which means that I'm committed to the view that there probably is lots of life around the universe. But even so, because the number of available planets is so large, it's still possible that these islands of life are so widely separated from each other that they never have a chance of ever encountering each other, which would be rather sad. I'm now going to skip to the last chapter, chapter 12, what is a miracle? And I'm going to return to the subject of supernatural magic. In the first chapter, I used supernatural magic, I used the phrase supernatural magic, to refer to things like frogs turning into princes and pumpkins turning into coaches and, and, and that sort of thing. But there's another kind of supernatural magic, or it's really the same kind, but it's a category that a lot of people believe. Nobody believes that, that um, frogs turn into princes or pumpkins turn into coaches. But lots of people believe that a prophet flew to heaven on a winged horse and another one walked on water and turned water into wine, as this cartoon shows. <laughs> then there are spooky ghost stories that many people believe. People will tell uncanny stories like, I dreamed about a long lost friend who I hadn't thought of for 40 years. And the very next morning, I woke up and found that he died in the night. Probably all heard stories like that. Miracle stories, rumors get spread because people like telling stories. They spread as rumours nowadays with the internet, they spread as, as internet urban legends. This is especially one of the ways in which this happens is when somebody famous dies. Um, Elvis Presley was seen on Mars after he died. Um, Marilyn Monroe came back as a lettuce. And <laughs> soon after Michael Jackson died in 2009, an American television crew was given a guided tour of his mansion called Neverland. And 
and in one scene of this film, people thought they saw the ghost of Michael Jackson at the end of the long corridor. Well, I looked at the recording, and I must say I wasn't that impressed, but it was enough to start rumours flying around the internet. Michael Jackson's ghost was seen all over the place, including in the hood of a car. See up there? Um, you, you and I will probably recognise that there's just some clouds reflected in the car, uh, but the eye of faith is see the face of Michael Jackson, and as you probably know, the face of Jesus and the face of the Virgin Mary are frequently seen in things like frying pans and pizzas and slices of toast. <laughs> um, and that picture of Michael Jackson in the, in the hood of the car is on YouTube and has received more than 15 million hits. <laughs> when I was a child, I, uh, my family lived in an, an old Tudor house, about 400 years old, um, called Cuckoo's, and it had wonky black Tudor beams, very old and very creaky. And not surprisingly, it had a legend about a long-dead priest hidden in a secret passage. Uh, there was a time when, uh, if you were a priest of the wrong sort, you tended to get burned at the stake. And they used to get hidden in priest holes in, 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 in houses. And this house, Cookies, had a legend of a priest. And it was said that you could hear his footsteps going up the stairs. But with a spooky addition, that there was one too many steps, that you heard one too many steps. And lo and behold, in the 16th century, there was an extra step in the staircase. Well, I told that story to my school friends, no doubt gained great kudos and prestige from telling this wonderful ghost story. It never occurred to me to ask how good the evidence was. It was enough that the house was old. My friends were impressed when I told them the story. People get a thrill from passing on ghost stories. And the same applies to miracle stories. If a rumour of a miracle gets written down in a book, then the rumour becomes hard to challenge, especially if the book is ancient. It becomes a tradition, and it becomes treated with greater respect for being old, when you might think it would be treated with less respect because there's been more time for it to get distorted. What about those strange stories of having a dream about a long-forgotten uncle uh, who, who you haven't thought of for 40 years, and then the, the morning after you dream about him, you wake up to discover that he died in the night. Well, the trouble is, of course, that um, that sort of thing only gets spread about when it is spooky. Nobody ever says, I dreamed about this long forgotten uncle I hadn't thought of for 40 years, and when I woke up, he had not died in the night. <laughs> it's only stories that are spooky that get passed around, and we hear them, and they get written up in the newspaper. Uh, or they get talked about on the radio and we think how amazing, how astonishing. Sometimes you can work out what really happened in an apparently spooky coincidence. Um, the great American physicist Richard Feynman, uh, his wife unfortunately died of cancer and the clock in her room stopped the very moment when she died. What an amazing, spooky story. But Feynman was not a great scientist for nothing. He worked out what really happened. The clock was 40. It had a tendency to stop if you tilted it on its side. The nurse, when Mrs. Feynman died, needed to record the exact time of death for the death certificate. It was rather dark in the room. So she picked up the clock, carried it over to the window in order to see the face, tilted the face so that she could see it, and of course the clock stopped. But even if that hadn't happened, even if we hadn't been given that explanation, it still would not, should not be, an impressive, miraculous story. Because clocks stop all the time, and once again you only tell the story. The story only gets spread around, and only grows in the telling, because stories do grow in the telling only gets spread around and grows in the telling if it is uh, an amazing, miraculous, apparently miraculous uh, story. 
we go back to the tale of the person who died in the night. Um, very often you will hear, he died at exactly the moment when I was grieving about him. So, well, when did he die? Uh, and the original story would have been, oh, well, probably died around 3 a.m. When were you dreaming? Well, it was a, could have been approximately 3 a.m. Before you know where you are, when the rumour starts spreading around, that about and that approximately gets shaved off because it's, it makes the story better. People enjoy telling a good story. 